Hi, hello and welcome to another video by Fermove. Today, I will continue this series of videos that I'm doing related to the Uyghur Tribunal that is taking place in London. Unfortunately, I really haven't had much time to watch all of them and put together all my ideas um, about all the hearings since, well, I'm, I'm busy shooting a documentary here. However, I would like to briefly point out a couple of things that stood out as being silly or just easily debunkable first, some, some facts from dates two and three, and I also want to dig a little deeper on a couple of witnesses from day four. Now, the first thing is um, I don't understand why the comments are disabled in the, the YouTube videos from the Uyghur Council. It's not like that they have to al allow them, but it is up to me that they don't allow different voices being heard in the comment section. That's to me a little bit interesting. All right, now I'm gonna start with um, a few pictures that were shown during the hearings. Um, on the first set of pictures that you'll see here, which of course for safety I have decided to blur since it's a child, you see the photo of a little girl that is said to be missing. However, the picture shown after that right here is the same little girl being interviewed by CGTN earlier this year, which again goes to prove that this little girl was not missing at all. Now, the second set of pictures that I show you here uh, shows a man who is said to be an activist in Xinjiang and is claimed to have been given a, a death sentence by Chinese authorities. Now, the second picture that I show you here is him talking to Chinese media and wondering why on earth would anyone say that he has been sentenced to death. Honestly, I do not know what to think of these Uyghur advocacy groups. They are either consciously and intentionally lying to the public or they're just utterly incompetent uh, at their jobs. They, they're just... It doesn't make any sense. I wish somebody would explain to me also how these advocacy groups plan to help the people in Xinjiang when after more sanctions are imposed on Xinjiang's industries uh, there will be more unemployment and the likeliness of unrest will increase. But anyway, let's continue. On, on the June 7th hearing, and in particular uh, this one given by a former police officer at uh, 51 minutes into their video, there is a police officer um, showing up on camera um, and he is using some kind of voice distortion software. <clears throat> the man's wearing sunglasses and uh, kind of like a COVID mask, nose and mask, and he's also wearing a Chinese police uniform. He's said to be living in exile in Germany, so here's a question. Are the police allowed to leave the force and keep their uniforms? Or is this just a prop designed to make things look more official? Here's the thing, the badge number is covered on his uniform, but his shoulder tags and the division tag, they're showing. I suppose it wouldn't be too difficult <laughs> to, to go through a database of police officers of a certain rank in a certain city and identify this person, even with the sunglasses and the mask, but anyway. That's just my thinking, but again, why go through the trouble of distorting his voice if this would be possible? Now, at one minute and, sorry, one hour and two minutes, the police officer talks about a system that is used to track the movement of Chinese people using their ID cards uh, whenever they buy a plane or a train ticket or do different transactions um, around the country. What he fails to mention is that this is done to all Chinese citizens and even foreigners all over China. Look, I have a fellow YouTuber um, from America who was greeted by a plainclothes police officer after he bought a ferry ticket in Shanghai by his name. Now, we could have a discussion about whether this is good or bad. However, it is clear that this is not done only to Uyghur people or, or that the practice takes place exclusively in Xinjiang. I would even go one step further and mention that the contact tracing apps that we are using here in China for COVID control, uh, I, I find them extremely effective at protecting both Chinese and foreigners, and they do the same thing. This contact tracing system tracks you entering and leaving pretty much any commercial establishment here in the country. Therefore, it's an even wider database that uh, what this police, or police officer is actually mentioning as being nefarious. So, I would agree that there is a discussion to be had regarding privacy. However, this has absolutely nothing to do with Xinjiang being singled out. Now, the added information at the end of this short speech by the police officer is that this system will be able to tell your political views and send an alert, uh, an alert that will end in the person being arrested. 
Now, all over the world, there are blacklists at airports, train stations, etc. So this is nothing out of the ordinary when it comes to national security procedures. The only thing that is different is the accusation that this arrest would actually take place because of someone's political views. The fact is that this witness provides zero evidence of this particular aspect of his statement. Now, at an hour and three minutes and 54 seconds, the officer goes on to say that the people are detained and questioned about their thoughts. And this information is then entered into the database that can be then cross-referenced when they're tracking people's uh, movements, right? Buying tickets, buying that. Now, I would like to take a second to think about what does he mean by thoughts? The Chinese government is implementing a novel de-radicalization program in order to protect the, the rest of the population in Xinjiang and China. How else would you go about finding out whether a person has been radicalized or not, other than to actually interview them and, and assess the level of radicalization? How would you do that? Again, I must admit that I'm not an expert in any of the procedures that I mentioned here. However, just by using my logic and presenting my argument here, I ask this question. It's an honest question. How else would you find out if a person has extremist radical ideas, other than asking them? And furthermore, what good would it be to ask only a few members of the community and not everyone? I know it sounds like I'm making excuses for what the government is doing. However, hear me out for a second. I put this out to you. If you are okay with a registered sex offender list, or a child molester database, or an animal cruelty registry in your community, in your country, do you care about the existence of those databases? The difference between those is that once are created after a person has committed a crime, that's all. Think about all those mass shooters in America who have shown time and time again signs of being unstable and dangerous to society, yet the authorities didn't pick on those indicators of the danger that these people pose to the community. Do you stand on the side of prevention of a crime or on the side of punishment after the fact? That's, that's the philosophical question here. That's the actual ethical question behind the, the attempt by Chinese government to de-radicalize extremists in Xinjiang, regardless of their nationality, their ethnicity, their ethnic group, or their religion. And before you jump on to a quick conclusion, to attack China for, for these prevented measures, let me remind you that France had a similar approach a few years earlier than China, yet nobody raises an eyebrow over that fact. Alright guys, uh, that's all the time I have for today. Uh, thank you very much for watching this video and uh, as always, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up. And if you like the content on my channel, then consider subscribing to it. And if you do that, don't forget to hit the bell button to be notified whenever there is a new video out. And do remember that if you want to support the work that I do, I really, really appreciate each and every one of you. Make sure to hit the link in the description down below to buy me a cup of coffee. Some of you are doing it and I really appreciate it. And if you're here in China and you want to support the work that I do uh, using WeChat, you can click, uh, you can scan the QR code here on the screen and do so. And well, until I see you again, take it easy and bye for now.